Cool. Thanks. Um, so welcome to the, uh, this is kind of the last, last talk we're doing at the I am the Cavalry track for 2018 at B-Sides Las Vegas. Um, we do have whiskey. We will pass that around in a little bit in case you missed the opening. Uh, this is cavalry whiskey, um, that one of the cavalry folks found, uh, on a trip. Um, and we thought it was only appropriate since we gave it away in the opening, uh, to give some away in the closing, because after a couple of days of intense conversation, thinking, debate, uh, and learning, um, you might need something stiffer than a beer. Uh, the back of it says two arms, two arms. And that's one of the things we want to, want to do in this conversation right now is to give you something to walk away with. So it's not just a bunch of good thought and insight and then it all just gets left on the cutting room floor and it's a, you know, on, on YouTube somewhere, but actually things that you can pick up, take away and do uh, when you walk out of this room. So it's a, a continuation, not an end to the conversation, but uh, more of a, a middle and then uh, carrying it on into the in real life world. Um, we've got a handful of folks up here uh, that we invited up uh, to help equip you to be able to do that. We're going to give them about five minutes each to give like a little thing. You know, what can you do when you walk out of this room? Um, we have uh, a couple of folks who built some open source tools that you can put on uh, your home network to identify IoT products and uh, or IoT stuff and security issues potentially with them. So it's kind of a democratization of uh, security uh, for the home. Um, we've got uh, Travis Moore over there from Tech Congress who you saw earlier today uh, to give a little pitch on like how to get involved and embedded in the public policy world, even if you think uh, you know, you're unqualified or underqualified to go into Congress, um, you might have a pathway for you. And then uh, Eli Sugarman with the Hewlett Foundation, um, who's one of the sponsors uh, of this conference and uh, helped us do, uh, made sure we could do public ground over in the Platinum um, to talk about some of the broader programmatic things that they're trying to do to bridge the gap between technology and public policy. Um, so I'm going to uh, hand off to Josh and surprise him, uh, let him say whatever he wants while uh, I bring the bottle of whiskey around and we all have something to toast with. It is our birthday. It is our birthday. Uh, speaking of birthdays, um, we've been told maybe we should promptly be at the main stage in the main room exactly at seven o'clock. So we might want to leave a few minutes early to go do that. I can't imagine why. Um, but as uh, some of these shots of uh, bourbon whiskey are, are poured, um, if you weren't here during the opening, we don't want to repeat too, too much, but there's been some outstanding content. I mean, we've had the privilege to have B-Sides give us this space um, every year for the five years of our existence. In fact, when we wanted to launch this, when I said I, we had to get this out of our system, uh, we weren't even on the schedule and they squeezed us in somehow. Um, we recorded pretty much everything and, and some of the sessions I wasn't even sure what we were going to see from them were really amazing. So please go back and watch many of these things. Uh, but as, as Bo pushes this out, you know, the idea, uh, if you did come in the middle, was that we were deeply concerned about the relationship between technology and the human condition. But more specifically, we were really concerned about public safety, human life and kept looking for the adults and couldn't find them. And when you know that no one's going to come save you, when you know the cavalry isn't coming, the point was it falls to us to be that that solution, to step into the void, to fill what was missing. And without being cliche about it, um, we really didn't know if it was going to work, right? It could have been like, you know, Custer's Last Stand. It could have been the March of Light Brigade. It could have been, you know, beautiful, but, but terrible. Um, but I think it's really hard to deny that looking back, um, we wanted to see, could we try a different way that might have different results? The blueprint works. And as I said in the opening remarks in the keynote for this, we know over the last five years we've had some pretty profound impact with your help, with your advocacy, with your ideas. What we really want to figure out isn't just keep limping along, but what's the next five years going to look like? You know, we've resisted forming a 501c3 or 501c6. We've resisted um, getting too public about our, our participation and the kind of things we've been doing. But I think for the next step, you know, we've been friends with Eli for a long, long time. And I think one of the, the, the zeitgeists that we share, and I hope I'm not stealing one of your quotes, but it's my favorite thing you've ever said. Uh, he said, there's certain things that the, uh, the public sector 
can't do. You met many amazing public sector folks, but there's things that the private sector won't do. So what do you do when there's things the public sector can't do, but the private sector won't do? And that falls to philanthropy, to altruism, to the, the crazy folks in the cavalry, right? So with that, you know, optimism and tenacity, I think what we found is we play a really vital role as an error handling routine for the gap between the public and private partnerships. And it's not something that we can own forever. It's not something that's going to scale. But the question I posed to each of you, and the reason we want to end, end on an action was this cannot be a spectator sport. It can't be like, I like what the cavalry is doing. It has to be, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to start. This is what project I'm going to sign up to lead because the only way this stuff happens is when you take a leadership role and you don't have to be an elite hack store. Most of the folks that have had the most profound contributions haven't been, but uh, I'm not going to keep going, but just to remind a few highlights, you know, when we started this, I said, people will have to die first before we'll get anyone to listen to us. And you've heard from Suzanne Schwartz and FDA and Seth, um, nobody died before they put in place the post-market guidance. And nobody died before they started strongly advocating for coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And nobody had died when they did their first safety communication for a bedside infusion pump because it had the potential to take human life. And the day I realized that, wait a second, we've already had an impact before harm was the day I knew we were on to something. And I'd like to tell you that was our crowning achievement, but I think because of that teamwork proven through Suzanne, it, it catalyzed folks in Congress like Jessica that you met, who started saying, wait a second, I like what they're doing here. Maybe the automotive regulators should do the same thing. And that got the attention of DHS, who started putting out safety specifics principles. And then that got the attention of Commerce Department, who said, you know, we should really codify coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And, you know, when you blink, you go from people thinking hackers equals criminals to several parts of the federal government are here this week. Last year, what you might not have known is we brought two sitting congressmen to DEFCON for two days to engage two sitting congressmen for the DC to DEFCON. I don't still to this day know how Bo pulled that off. But, you know, if, if the idea was to build uh, empathy and trust between the gaps between public sector and private sector, um, hopefully everyone's got a shot class right now. Please, uh, almost done. You got two more. You got the perfect amount. Okay, perfect amount. Perfect amount. We plan it that way. Yeah. All right. So I would like to uh, everyone that is of drinking age and willing to drink, um, raise a glass. The idea was we knew eventually we'd figure this stuff out, and the world would figure out how to make safer, more trustworthy, and reliable devices. We knew eventually that would happen. That was never. The mission here. The mission was to be safer sooner by working together, and it's been a privilege to work together with each of you. Thank you. Um, you can tell the amount of planning that went into this because we had to calculate the number of people that were going to be in our first session drinking <laughs> and today's session drinking, and we did it absolutely perfectly. I mean, facts don't lie, right? Um, so I want to uh, turn it over to some of our guests up here on stage uh, who are going to talk about specific ways that you can put cavalry intention into kinetic action um, with uh, a technical, a um, career-ish thing, and then some broader things that maybe catapult you into a, a different um, kind of stratosphere. So... Uh, guys, I'll turn it over to you. You want to get up here and, and run some slides? Sure. Um, awesome. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, Josh. I, I've been following this uh, project for years. I'm a true uh, believer in uh, I am the Calvary. Um, if you actually follow some of my talks in the past, I have warned that basically, just like he says, nobody's coming. Right? The problem is at times, it's what's available for those who want, who want to do something, right? So I decided, me and Joe, we decided to do something. We decided to take some of the principles in the technology that's cutting edge and it's right now dominant in Silicon Valley, and we decided to put it together in something that you can put at home, and we decided to give it away. So we created Chiron, which is what you're looking at right now, and that is my house. 
so uh, for example, I dox myself. So there's, uh, there's my house right there. I have around 20 something IOTs, which is very rare, but I work in uh, security research. So uh, I wouldn't ask anybody to do something I wouldn't do myself. So um, what we try to do is basically we try to create something that grandma can use. And when we talk about grandma, we're talking about the lowest common denominator of a user. We wanted to create something that you just put it on, you reboot it, and then you browse to it using a, a, any type of browser. We created a series of automated tasks. So we use, for example, we use, because we know that technically the, the best approach is probably to put a tap in certain environments, we know that's possibly not, not achievable in a home network. So we usually we look at the home network, you have the connection for your modem, and then you have the wireless, which is what mainly everything runs there, or your fire stick, your TV, uh, your toaster, your refrigerator, everything. So we decided basically to use a couple of tools uh, that, that do passive capture of, of information. One of them is the POF. Uh, one of them is a bro. So basically, um, with those two, we added MMAP, and with MMAP, uh, we created cron jobs of all this. So the, the, the tool is constantly receiving information and parsing information on bro, mainly brocon and HTTP. The, the tool will scan your network slash 24. Basically, it grabs the, the HTTP address, and then there's a script that says, okay, so if your network is this, then I will pass these parameters to MMAP. I will do this every four hours, and then I will post it to uh, Kavana. So we, we decided to use uh, EOK, which is open source as well. So uh, uh, we created with that, we create a visualization. The visualization basically tells you what's going on in your, in your, in your uh, environment. So you can see on the top right, that's obviously you need to let it run a little bit, but you can see uh, the traffic, you can see the the top active home network IPs. You can see the top destinations. So we, uh, you can do visualizations with UIP. So for example, you can see, for example, what is an IP from Russia connecting to my camera? Why is it a, an IP from China connecting to my lock, right? My, uh, my, my um, anything you may have, monitor, camera, whatever, DVD. Uh, and actually, you know, um, if you actually see there, I was able to, to find out that I had a, uh, I had a, uh, an old um, VNC uh, show my PC installation at home, thanks to Chiron. So I, I, I run the, I just let it run, just put it on, let it run. And then I, I see the port for, for VNC. I said, okay, that's probably means I'm compromised. Uh, when I looked at it, it was a, a, an all install of uh, uh, show my PC that's been there for years and it's been pinging back and I had no idea. So what happens for most of the time at homes is nobody knows what's going on. You had no idea what these things are connecting. Uh, lately, we even heard that they now call the police apparently. Uh, there's a case of Alexa that apparently called the police when somebody was beating somebody down. Uh, so we need to know what these things do and seeing is believing. And, and showing uh, a list of what's going on. Even, even if we say, hey, you have an IP on the other side of the world connecting to your house. This might be something you want to take a look at. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add open source vulnerability uh, assessment tools. So for example, we're going to run NMAP as NSE scans. And then we're going to create visualization that says, hey, you have your uh, TV has hard relief, for example or your device has a, a, a default credits for SSH, right? We have to find a way to make it easier for the end user, but, but that's, our, that's our struggle. And that's, that's what we're pursuing. We're, we're pursuing a way to basically put this at home and then let it run. And maybe later on, we'll create a, maybe a cloud uh, a place where we can basically grab, sanitize this info because I, I'm an a, a advocate for privacy, sanitize this info, and detect and even predict storms. 
if you go to to your to the homes, and I, I I'm a person that worked in a, one of the biggest uh, security operation centers in the world. Most of those botnets come from things at home. If you look at Mirai, uh, even VPN filter, I was I had to to write a a a security update on VPN filter. Come to find out, two of my devices were vulnerable. <laughs> I was like, oh wait a minute, this is my NAS. <laughs> So this is this is how this is how critical these things are. We're putting all this stuff on the internet. I'm gonna say this again: Don't put your toaster on the internet, or your car, or your pacemaker. A pacemaker wear Wi-Fi for God's sake. So this is is a way to 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 approach that. It's open source. We can give you access to the GitHub. You can modify it wherever you want. You can add anything you want. Um, you know, at times, some of the technology we had to fight, you know, previous employers because they were doubtful what we we're going to put out there. Uh, we did it. Uh, so, so that's what we do. So, Rod, you're uh, taking capabilities that typically would cost uh, multiple millions of dollars in a corporation, the tool sets to do that, and you're making it available to, uh, you know, grandma, grandpa, Absolutely. stay at home. Cool. So if somebody wants to get involved and engaged in this project that you've got, uh, have you got a, uh, a GitHub link for them yeah. or some way to get involved? It's right there. Cool. So what's that? Uh, just read it out. So it's the camera. A GitHub forward slash J Z A D E H forward slash Chiron dash E O K. Cool. Level. Oh, sorry. Man, I, I think there's one more. Uh, we have a top level. But this sort of started out like on our own personal GitHubs, and there's kind of like an evolution of like we're a lifelong student, so this is like um, kind of thought of originally as teaching tools. The first, is, is the Action link up here too? The Action is here too. Yeah, so like just kind of real quick, quick here, like kind of getting a little into this um, sort of like just the history of how all this started. Like we originally started a couple years ago doing Action, which is like basically. Can we like, uh, can we just put the links in the the YouTube video? Yep, exactly. And then that way people yep. can can go cruise that and see it and check it out. And and basically just start it's it's like starts at uh, uh, GitHub Jays a day, and these are all, all going to be in the YouTube video. Awesome. So, so um, but thank you guys. Is the, is awesome. Yep. Next, we'll hand it over to Eli Sugarman of the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, give us some perspectives and thoughts on how uh, he's trying to get uh, security researchers engaged. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Bo. And I I apologize, or I guess I, I'm I, I don't that my talk will be a little less a little less technical but essentially the Hewlett Foundation we're a big private philanthropy and so we serve a charitable purpose and my program really focuses on building a cybersecurity field that brings together those with technical expertise legal expertise policy expertise really just acknowledging what the gentlemen were talking about that digital devices and connected devices are in our lives and they're largely insecure and so as a society we need to think about this stuff and it's not getting enough attention at the policy level despite the best efforts of a lot of policy entrepreneurs. And so it's, it's a credit to the cavalry for really innovating um, new ways to engage and to really have that impact. And so one of the things that the cyber initiative at the foundation is trying to do is just find ways to, to, to sort of you know, open the tent up, broaden it out, and really say, if you have a technical background and you really want to get involved in law and policy and regulatory change of the kind that Josh and Bo and all of you know, many of you are involved with, there, there are a lot of different avenues open to you, but they're not always clear. And so what I was hoping to do is just mention a few of them and really just signal that, that our role is to help build the platform, to help build those channels so that you can get involved and bring the deep expertise that you have to bear, to sort of work with Travis and sort of his colleagues in Congress to write better laws, to work with the executive branch to pass better regulations, and to work with a lot of the nonprofits who are trying to impact those policies to really have better ideas. Because I think it's fair to say that a lot of the think tanks and a lot of the nonprofits really want to do better when it comes to advocating on tech policy and cyber issues, but they need your help to do so. So, so to get a little bit more concrete, I think there are a few things that you can really do when you step out the door to really have an impact. One is you can sort of pursue fellowships and say, I come from more of a technical background, but I want to go serve in government. I want to work on the Hill. I want to go work at a think tank. I want to go work at a nonprofit. And it can be daunting to figure out where those opportunities are. But talking to people like Travis, talk to me. There are lots of others who can help steer you and say, these are groups who need your knowledge. Right now, I know of at least two big think tanks in Washington, D.C. who are going to be advertising jobs. 
where they want people largely like you to come in-house and to help them do better because they have a lot of law, they have a lot of national security, they have a lot of policy expertise. They really don't have any clue about, frankly, many of the things that were just discussed, let alone how the internet is architected or a lot of the other issues that have been discussed at B-Sides. So sort of those opportunities to serve and to really, you know, take a year or two years, a bit of a detour in your career, you can have amazing impact. And just to say that, that I want to help, if you're interested, find those opportunities. Um, you can also do a lot more to write and to educate by leveraging the media. Obviously, you know, you love certain websites, certain Twitter feeds, certain blogs. There are probably others that, that you know, you know about or, or might want to read. It's surprisingly easy to actually write and to get your ideas out there. All it takes is a little bit of time and effort to cultivate relationships with those platforms and then to adjust the way that you communicate and write, working with them to get your ideas out there. And so another thing is, um, you know, some of the technical blogs and some of the publications like are probably a safer space. But, you know, one in one example is sort of, you know, the Lawfare blog that publishes a lot on encryption and a lot of the issues you may be interested in. They are hungry for authors who have a technical background and come from this community to write for them because they know that they're weak in that area. So those are a lot of the groups. That I think there are media plays there where you can push your ideas out there and shape the debate that way. Um, and, and then I think there are ways to just sort of build relationships, right? And this is a lot of what Josh and Bo, I think, have done extremely effectively, where if you can build trust with somebody from a different tribe or a different entity or government stakeholder, oftentimes you can then get to the point where they'll call you and say, hey, what should I do? What do you think about this? They'll invite you to that conversation that isn't public. And you can just sort of do a brain dump and sort of say, like, have you thought about this? Or how about that? Do you even know these people? And so I think spending the time to reach out and really help people find their way, whether it's at the conferences happening in Vegas this week or elsewhere, goes a long way. And again, that's a place where the foundation, Tech Congress, I'm the Cavalry can help sort of steer you to those people who may share your interests and may actually be looking for someone like you, even though they didn't even know that you existed. And so all to say that those big policy issues that you know and care about, you can influence them. I know you're already doing a lot of hard work with the Cavalry and with other you know, sort of nonprofit and, and volunteer and sort of activist organizations. But I think there are a lot of opportunities. Um, and so I think just like anything in life, you know, it takes a little bit of research. It takes a little bit of time. Um, the foundation is really honored to support the cavalry and to help fund B-sides and some of their work, because I think they're really setting the example that a lot of other groups should follow, but aren't quite there yet. And I'm hoping over time that model is copied by more and more groups that sort of broaden beyond safety to a lot of those other really important areas, but don't really have the sophistication and sort of just the, the vision that I think a lot of the, the folks in the room do. So just to say, I want to do anything I can do to help. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Eli Sugarman. You can email me. I don't have slides, but um, I can make sure that my email address sort of is made available. It's also just esugarman at hewlett.org. And so, you know, thank you again for your time. All right. Thanks, Eli. Um, so now we want to uh, call up Travis Moore, who he's already talked about Tech Congress and a little bit, uh, but we want to capture like a nice, quick, succinct five minute uh, overview and how you can actually get involved and engaged. Thanks, Bo. So I'm, I'm going to sell you on going to work in Congress. <laughs> yeah, we, we as, uh, as Bo and Eli mentioned, we, we place, and if you saw the panel earlier, we place technologists to work. Um, in, in one of the places that is most hostile to, um, but increasingly less so, uh, but is most hostile to technology in, um, in, in the world, the United States Congress. So why, why are we doing this? There are 3,500 legislative staff in Congress. F who's got a ballpark of how many of those folks are technical? You can't answer if you were at my earlier. <laughs> Zero. You're close. You're actually quite close. Anyone else? Two. Also very close. It's 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 under ten. Seven. It was five until until last year, and I'm proud to say two of our alumni are the first two um, technologists hired um, in the United States Senate. Uh, this is a problem for obvious reasons. I probably don't need to explain to you. Technology is the infrastructure of our daily lives. It's embedded in in ev in everything that we do, um, and and our. Our premise is that decent, functional, independent government requires this expertise in-house. 
the House and the Senate Intelligence Committees, which are investigating how Russia meddled in our elections. You want to know how many technical staff they have on hand? Zero. No one that understands computing forensics or attribution. These are, these are not, not technical things, right? Um, this, is, this is not just about a, a new fun app. This is, about, this is about fundamentally about our democracy, right? Um, and so we are placing technologists in roles where they can have a direct, direct impact. So one really great example of that, um, one of our fellows last year, um, a guy named Chris Seguin, um, Chris was at the ACLU before he went to go in tech Congress. He thought he'd do the fellowship, spend a year in Congress, become a better activist, um, go back out to civil society. Um, and what he found was um, that within his first uh, two months, he was able to get more done inside Congress than he'd been able to get done in the prior four years. Uh, half dozen issues he got done right off the bat. He uh, got the Department of Defense to adopt advanced email encryption. He got the Department of Homeland Security to adopt advanced email encryption. He got the Senate and the United States Congress to approve Signal, and he got a half a dozen senators actually using it. He helped break story about uh, foreign intelligence services using um, Stingray devices in Washington, D.C., right by the White House, when the Department of Homeland Security was doing essentially nothing about that. Uh, last fall... When um, the sexual harassment was uh, was when Me Too broke and was um, was uh, taking down multiple members of Congress, he walked over to the Office of Compliance. Um, this is the HR office for the United States Congress, and he said, "Walk me through how you're storing these sexual harassment complaints. But, you know, how are you how are you taking this in? Where where's it being served?" Uh, where's it being stored? He he found that it's being stored on. It was being stored on um, random company that random vendor that they were using, offsite, extraordinarily minimally um, secured, no uh, security audits. Um, he had that locked down. By the way, uh, by the way, the John Conyers allegation. John Conyers, who was chairman of the Judiciary Committee, nobody knows how that story got out. We, we had Russia meddle in our 2016 elections. There's no knowing whether or not uh, other intelligence services were meddling in or had access to um, that information. Uh, just three weeks ago, he helped break a story that um, a, a voting machine, leading voting machine manufacturer, this was a company that processed 60% of the ballots in 2006. Contrary to um, all public statements they'd made prior was allowing remote access to their voting machines. These are these are big deals, right? This is a this is a big deal, and um, it's not just Chris. Uh, if you were here earlier, you saw John. John is um, we brought John in. He's working for Senator Gardner. He is running the Senate Cybersecurity Caucus. Um, he had uh, Bo up uh, about. Uh, Two months ago, they brought in um, Bo and um, some other folks brought in a bunch of IoT devices and hacked them live in front of a, a bunch of congressional staff to, uh, to help people understand the vulnerabilities there. Um, so uh, another fellow, Buki Adebayo, um, working for Senator Udall, anybody see the stories about um, the ACLU running uh, portraits of members of Congress through this uh, Amazon facial recognition? Right. So she's working on uh, she is working on a, a legislative response to Maybe we should be thinking more critically about um, our, our, our biometric uh, biometric privacy and whether we should we should have some um, sensible limits or 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 we should be thinking about um, uh, limits on on facial rec. So extraordinarily impactful things, and these folks serve as receptives to, receptors for all of you all. So my my call to action. We're recruiting right now. We're recruiting for the next 32 days for our next class of fellows for 2019. Um, so I'm going to ask three things of you. Um, one is, if you have ever had an inkling that you think you might want to work in government, apply. Um, if you don't want to apply, everybody in this room has some friend that gets really riled up when we talk about politics um, that... Uh, is really engaged in, in, in political conversation, nominate them. So techcongress.io slash nominate. Please nominate them. Every single fellow that we've had to date has come from a personal referral. Um, and so it's this, this community can help us send our next set. 
So if you have someone, everybody in here probably has someone they can think of, nominate them. Third, if, if you can't be bothered to do that, go to our Twitter at Congress fellows, retweet our application announcement. Um, it's pinned to the top of our page that re that may sound, um, insignificant, but getting the word out is hugely, hugely important. So, um, that's it. No experience in government. That doesn't matter. What, what we do is we provide a really, really great education into how government works. It's a tour of duty. It's one year. Um, we pay 80 K, which is a huge pay cut for probably most of you. Um, but I can guarantee you it is, um, an extraordinarily meaningful and impactful experience. And so if you know anyone, come find me. Um, my email is all over our website, Travis at techcongress.io. But we need help finding great candidates. So send them to us. Um, and if you think you might be interested, please apply yourself. Thanks. Thanks, Travis. Um, so you've had two days of content or... Uh, enough to fill up uh, a substantial portion of your YouTube bucket uh, for the month. Um, we wanted to, to now flip from us talking to you, to you guys telling us some of maybe your favorite moments from the last five years or some of the things that you look at and you're like, wow, that's kind of cool. I can't believe that that happened. Um, or uh, some ideas for what to do next, where to go. Um, five years in, we're at a little bit of a crossroads. Uh, and so we need to, to have help from the folks who are going to pick this up and continue it on and keep going uh, for the next five years because um, you know, uh, people change, times change, uh, and we need to, to broaden our uh, number of people contributing and helping. So I uh, wanted to throw it out to the crowd. We've got a portable mic here. We'll run around and uh, hand it off to you, and you guys can tell us um, what you're thinking, uh, maybe something you saw today or yesterday that just you know, lit your brain up like a Christmas tree um, and got you stimulated and you want to talk about it. Yeah, I've got one in back. Can you run? So um, I really want to thank you, thank everyone up there. I get a lot of hope and uh, 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 from, from the I Am The Calvary movement. I think, I have you, you've, you mentioned this a little bit, but considered taking money and considered incorporating or, or forming that formal structure, uh, obtaining funds. You've done great work with a shoestring and, and uh, I hope everyone's taking care of their health and, and, you know, we're checking in about burn in. That's obviously really important. Um, but I, I can't uh, help but think that with a little bit of funding, this could work even better, perhaps, or. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we've we've thought a lot about uh, taking funding, not taking funding. One of the nice things about the uh, existing structure that we have is that we're truly independent. Um, you know, it's free time, spare time stuff. That gives us a kind of a different status uh, in DC and when we go to talk to companies and different things than if we're like an advocacy group um, or a lobbying group or a professional group or any of the other kind of nonprofit statuses that you can have. There's different trade-offs to it. Uh, I think, you know, so far we've kind of erred on the side of maintaining that independence, that volunteer status. Um, but it's, uh, it is getting to the point where it's tough to get any bigger and do any more without having some kind of support infrastructure. And that might mean incorporating. It might mean teaming up with some other partners who are already incorporated and doing things in the same kind of area. Uh, you know, folks like uh, Eli and Hewlett, um, folks like Travis and Tech Congress, uh, where we can work on small projects together uh, in, again, a fully volunteer fashion. Uh, but they provide the support infrastructure to be able to scale something bigger and make it uh, kind of blow up. Um, so all really good questions. If you've got any specific ideas, let's catch up over a beer, uh, and we can talk about it. Yeah. Where do we begin? Um, <clears throat> probably, uh, uh, been so much of a mentor to me actually as a regulator that just to see how you guys conduct yourselves, professionalism, um, and leading with empathy, uh, how you converse with people and get people to uh, understand what you're taking a technical uh, 
subject matter and, and making it understandable. Um, so it's been extremely powerful as a federal regulator and, and made, me, made me better. And, and also to know that you guys are out there doing what you do, um, it, it, I, I struggle on a daily basis to feel like I'm making an impact. Uh, and I, I think that we are making an impact uh, but what I am struggling, to know that you guys are out there doing and struggling as well, I think that's hugely important. So I think we're all working towards the same goal from different angles. So we should struggle more. Okay. So just to know that pe people, you know, we, we struggle. These are weighty, weighty issues. And some, maybe I feel kind of selfish because you guys are dealing with other industries like automotive. Um, so why should we be complaining about medical devices uh, or, you know, the weighty issues around medical devices? But um, just wanted to thank you for your, your leadership and kindness and uh, showing us uh, that empathy can be such a powerful tool. Thank you. Um, and one of the, I think, highlights of our past few years has been working with folks like you uh, at FDA as well as other places that really want to be safer sooner together. It's not just a tagline. It's actual thing that we can do. Um, and I think uh, rather than being frustrated in isolation, uh, or struggling in isolation. Um, it's really too, true that teaming up together, uh, we might struggle together, but hopefully the individual struggle is a little bit less and the effect is a little bit more. Yeah, in the back. So um, I really appreciate the presentations, um, specifically the gentleman from the UK and basically the, the three principles of IoT. It's like, hey, if you're not doing these three things, we're just done, um, which is awesome. And I, in my role, I I have an opportunity to to tweak at some folks who are doing stuff in the electric sector. So I look forward to repurposing these these themes. And and when people come up to me and say, "Oh, what do we do about IoT?" You say, "Hey, there's." Here's a list. It's super easy. There's three things on there. If the manufacturer, I don't care who it is, if they're not doing these three things, it's time to talk to somebody else. Super easy. But um, and I appreciate the the software tool on uh, that you can give to your grandma in a in a portable thing. She can click on it. It'd be awesome. Um, but I wanted to thank uh, Bo. I wanted to thank you, and I want to thank Josh. Uh, for the five years that you've invested into this. And I wanted to tell you that I appreciate it's a nuanced message of I am the Calvary. And I, I very much appreciate our government partners who are here with us right now, even though it's 10 o'clock in Washington, D.C., but that's okay. You're here with us right now. And and I am the Calvary. It's, it's not a swipe. It is not a swipe at our government partners, and I appreciate that you're here with us. It's helping all of us understand that we ourselves have a role to accomplish in terms of sustainability and surviving and, and moving forward, and to do so in partnership with, with the government, with academia, with trade associations, with uh, uh, trusts and, and um and investors like Hewlett and others who are focused on, you know, preserving, preserving freedom and, and life as we know it. So I appreciate your message. Uh, just let's go another five years. Cool. Thank you. Um, and uh, we've got about 30 more time for about 30 more seconds. If somebody has one last thing and then we'll adjourn to the closing ceremonies. Got one over here, yeah. Uh, information security became a, a focus of mine about a year ago. And during that time, I've seen responsible uh, vulnerability disclosure be the standard. So from my perspective, you've made an impact. Like, that's my normal mode. Uh, if I don't see people doing that, I'm like, what's wrong with them? Could I get it to the other guys? So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And that's a really interesting perspective for some of us, you know, old crusty hackers. Uh, we forget that there's uh, young blood coming up that doesn't know any way other than what um, has been put in place in the last few years. So 
I'm very, very happy to have been part of making the change happen to where you, know, you just grow up in this world. Um, it took a lot of hard fighting on our part, but uh, now if that's the if that's your only reality that you know, that's kind of cool. Um, Bo and I tried to pick our top five, and we forgot more things than than uh, we remembered. But uh, I struggled with what was my favorite moment. Was it killing three people in the ER hacking simulations in Arizona? Was it uh, getting two congressmen to come to DEF CON last year? Was it you know, testifying on a bill I helped construct to do things like basic cyber hygiene for IoT devices? And I think um, my favorite uh, thing is getting to work with incredible people like uh, like Bo Woods in general. So I think my favorite part of this is uh, the friendship I've formed with Bo. I want to give him a hug. <laughs>